All right, now we're going to move on to a new topic. <coughs> I'm choking up a little so good. Um, Perhaps you should drink some of your solution. I should drink some of my solution. All right, today, I mm, love that vitamin yeah, water. I'm pretty sure that color doesn't occur in nature, though. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> okay. Um, why do things dissolve? Um because they get attracted to other particles other than themselves. There's actually sort of three things that happen when you have um, something dissolve in something. All right? Well, the answer is, is there actually some attractive forces. So it's related to, say, Chapter um, 8, or if you've been watching the podcast, uh, Chapter 8 podcast, where we learn about um, how things um, work. Um, in terms of bond energies and stuff like that. And you notice you see some delta H's here. Mm. You've got an H1, an H2, and an H3. Essentially, in step one, or delta H1, you must have the solute expand or separate. Mm -hmm. And that requires energy. That amount of energy we're going to call delta H1. You also need the solvent to kind of spread out so it can make room for the solute. Mm -hmm. So it also needs to expand, and it, that is what we call delta H2. Now, both of these will always be endothermic, meaning right. it requires energy to expand the solute, essentially to break the bonds of the solute that, to itself, and the same for delta H2, so it will always be exothermic. And Endothermic. I said exo. I meant endo, and I wrote positive. It is endothermic. Endo. 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 Okay. However, then there is a third step. Is you see the solute, which is uh, blue in our picture, and the solvent have to be attracted to each other. Yeah. And if they are attracted to each other, they like each other, then you will have a, a third delta H, and that's delta H three, and it will all well. If it's attracted, it will be negative. Mm -hmm. If it's not attracted, it will be positive, and then actually it will not dissolve. Because for this to actually work, you need to have the net effect as you must have an exothermic reaction or it will not dissolve. Okay? So here's actually, uh, well, same picture with expansion. Here's actually the picture I was looking for. So if you do delta H1 and delta H2, which is always endothermic, hence the arrow going up, the uh, uh, orange arrow, and delta H3 being negative, highly negative, what's going to happen is the delta H of the solution will be negative. And the reaction, or the, the substance, will dissolve. Now, if we look at the second one, case over here, delta H1 and 2 are both positive. Delta H3 is negative, but not very negative. The delta H of solution will be um, positive. And actually, this will still work. Yeah, it'll still dissolve. But if you get too much, if this number's too big, then it will not dissolve. Actually, if it's, this is still negative. It's still negative, yeah, so it'll work. But there are instances, and we'll show you an example of that in a couple of minutes, where they don't dissolve. Okay? So let's illustrate this with a little demonstration. So here I am with some uh, calcium chloride. And uh, in the beaker, I have some water. And you can see I have a, a temperature probe. And so you're seeing the temperature. What's the temperature, Mr. Sam? 18.7. Uh, so 18.7. So I'm going to put some calcium chloride into the water so it will dissolve. All right? So as I pour some calcium chloride into the it is now dissolving. All right. Let me now stir this up here. And you 19, should see the temperature rising. What's happening is that delta H3 that we talked about um, is very, very high. And so this is a, uh, a very exothermic heat of solution. So as it dissolves, and you can see the little pellets are dissolving, um, the calcium chloride is expanding. The water is expanding to accommodate it. And the delta H3, the attraction between the calciums in the water and the chlorides in the water, is uh, quite exothermic. And so this reaction, the temperature, should be significantly higher than it was before, yep. as, as you can see. So just we're watching something dissolve, but we're also seeing the temperature change. And we can actually calculate the heat of solution. Uh, we did this lab, actually, uh, in, in our classes. And so this is just um, this is why this dissolves, because that high value of delta H3. All right, so now we're back to the screen, and we can uh, see how that all works. Um, and so uh, in terms of energy, if the delta H1 is large, this is a polar solvent and a polar solute, and delta H2 is large, delta H3 is a very large negative, and the heat of solution is small, and the solution will form. 
Now, if you have a polar solvent and a nonpolar solute, we haven't really talked about this, but we were just about to, you have a small delta H1, a large delta H2, this small, and actually no solution will form in this case. That's when you take polar with a nonpolar. You might remember the like dissolves the like, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and I'll show you too. It's very good. And nonpolar with nonpolar, it's small, 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 and actually you'll make a solution. And if you have a nonpolar and polar, delta H1 is large, small, small, no solution. So basically, most of them get, uh, um, here's a solution. About half of them make solutions and half of them don't. But the reason has to do with this delta H1, delta H2, and delta H3. That makes sense? So we've already kind of said this, but like dissolves. Like. Like. I like you. All right. Um, <laughs> so that means, but it's not that the red dissolves red. No. Right? Pol yeah. The like polarity is like. Like in terms right. of polar. So polar dissolves polar. polar. Nonpolar dissolves nonpolar, non but polar does not dissolve nonpolar. Sort of. What? What do you mean by Given sort? enough time, everything will dissolve in water. True. It, with very small amounts. All right, so, so let's illustrate that with uh, a demo. Okay, well, I've got, I've got some water. And uh, to the water, I'm going to add some Cairo syrup. Mmm, right. syrup. Syrup. So if I add the syrup, and if you look carefully, yeah, zoom in on that, Mr. Sims. You kind of see the syrup down there at the bottom right there. But if I stir it, what's happening is the Cairo syrup is a very um, tasty thing, but you can see there's still some strands, but it's dissolving in there because the Cairo syrup is polar. Polar dissolves polar. Like dissolves like. Got it? Okay. All right. Now, let's start talking about a next one. Uh, so now we're back, and I've got some more water. But instead of having K-Row syrup, I've got vegetable oil. All right. So I'm going to pour the vegetable oil into the water. Now, it looks like it's mixing. But if you look carefully, you'll notice that we have a layer of the vegetable oil where the stirring rod is, and below that, a, a layer of water. Now, I can mix it up like I did the uh, Cairo syrup in the water, and we can allow it to settle. But notice what did not happen. It did not, and it will not, dissolve. So it does not dissolve because you have a layer here of the, uh, right here, of the vegetable oil. There's little bubbles and such. That'll eventually disappear, and then there's water. And so, because the water, of course, is polar, uh, based on its Lewis dot structure and all that stuff. Vegetable oil is not polar, therefore, um, polar does not dissolve into nonpolar. All right, so, yeah, you've seen the cool examples of that. But why is that? Why do, why do polar dissolve polar and nonpolar dissolve nonpolar? Well, it has to do with that delta H1, 2, and 3. I think one thing that a good way to illustrate at least the polar polar, if I take the water, draw some uh, little Mickey Mouse heads, right? That's the water molecule. And if I were to drop some, uh, we used uh, uh, another polar substance. I mean, remember, what does polar mean is that this has a slightly uh, positive charge here and a slightly negative charge here. Or the way we could illustrate that oftentimes is we'll, we'll draw an arrow to the negative side and this is the positive side. If I then put something that has a negative charge in here, or let, let's take a polar molecule that has a negative end and a positive end. You see there's like a dashed line between here and here. That is an attractive force. This is this delta H sub 3. And then this positive right here is attracted to this negative. And so this polar molecule, which is kind of an oval I've drawn it as, is why it dissolves. Okay, and why do polar dissolve, not uh, mix with nonpolar? Well, it all goes back to that delta H1, 2, and 3 business. Um, but I think a key thing to understand there is that if you've got something that's polar, it's got a positive end and a negative end, and then you put something in there that has no positive or negative end, there is no attraction here. So they don't dissolve in each other. That was the oil and the vinegar. In nonpolar and nonpolar, you've got two substances and they don't have polarity, so they e easily can move. That's an arrow moving it. And this one can slide past each other. Okay? Questions? All right. One more thing I think we want to talk about. What are the pressure effects of concentration mm. or of uh, solubility? So the higher the pressure, the what? 
Uh, the more gas that can dissolve the water. Yeah. Now you, you understand this. Um, if you have a, a can of soda, all right. If you have a can of soda, um, it has got, of course, carbon dioxide dissolved in water. It's carbonated, right? And so, um, actually, when they make the uh, can of soda, they actually make it under a pressure of about four atmospheres. Mm -hmm. And so, what actually happens is we make what we call a supersaturated solution of carbon dioxide in water. All right, and this uh, follows what's called Henry's law that the pressure is equal to some constant times the concentration. All right. All right. Now, we don't need to spend too much time on this mathematically. I just understand that the higher the pressure, I think you understand it more conceptually. I've never seen, for example, in the AP test, a question that involves yeah, I think Henry's law I think mathematically. One in your homework, um, but, but if you do, plug and chug. it's just plug it into yeah. a quick, and they would give you the equation and you would use it. So, in the constant, it, it's very simple. All right? So, here, here's a, a way to illustrate it you have a pressure one and a pressure two. The gases, these are gas molecules, uh, more of them can dissolve when you have a higher air pressure over the top. All right. All right. Now, temperature effects. Now, in temperature effects, now um, we have sort of two cases. A solid can be dissolved in a liquid. Mm -hmm. So generally, the higher the temperature, the greater the solubility. Greater the solubility. This is for a solid dissolved in a liquid. So this is like salt water. So if I have salt water, basically hot salt water will dissolve more salt. More salt than cold salt water. Yeah. Now, actually, with a gas in a liquid, it's the reverse, the opposite, isn't it? Yeah. The higher the temperature, the the lower the solubility. Lower the now, solubility. Now, this is applications if you like to fish. Anybody who likes to fish knows that the best trout come from nice, icy, cold water. Because in icy, cold water, there's lots and lots of oxygen. Because the water is pouring over the rocks, and it's nice and cold, and as it falls over the rocks, it picks up oxygen from the air, more of it dissolves. So the fish have lots of oxygen. They're real, uh, they're real vigorous, and so they have um, nice strong, tight muscles when they taste really yummy when you eat them. The problem is if you pull a, a fish out of a, a kind of a warmish lake, they're always kind of mushy and bleh, because you got a lethargic fish because it doesn't have as much oxygen. Yummy. Sad fish. All right. Um, important to understand this is, is a, lot, I mean, a lot of people don't understand this. What does a fish actually breathe? Oxygen. Yeah, but a lot of people think that they're actually breathing water. Mm, it's the oxygen dissolved in the water. Yeah, you see, when they just, their gills get the oxygen out of the water. Our lungs there's get water, the oxygen out of the air. There's water, but dissolved in there, in between the water molecules, are little O2 molecules. They breathe oxygen just like humans do in terms of uh, they need the same chemical. They extract it in a different way out of the solution where we breathe it directly out of the air. Which but they need the sweet. oxygen. Now, this graph, we should make a note here. This graph illustrates that the higher the temperature, the lower the concentration. Here Here's oxygen right here. I think it's the blue line there. And so the lower the uh, solubility. So you have a lot more. Now we should go back to this graph. This is a, the, this is a solid, solid, S-O-L-I-D, solid in um, water. And so you can see generally, now I said this in the, in the, on the text, that generally speaking, the higher the temperature, this is temperature down here, of course, the higher the solubility. So if you look mm -hmm. at sodium nitrate here, um, it gets higher and higher the higher the temperature. Um, there are some exceptions. Yeah, they tend to be sulfates. Sulfates, like the cesium, yeah. uh, or cerium, I think. Whatever, this sulfate goes down. But generally yeah. speaking, it's the ones sodium that... Sodium sulfate actually goes down, too. Yes, yeah, sodium yeah. sulfate does. Ammonia does, too. So yeah. there's some exceptions. That's actually more well, like ammonia gas. Ammonia is a gas. That's so why. So that doesn't apply. So um, you can see they generally get higher. And so what should we said, so this is generally true for solids, but it is always true for gases, this decreasing thing that we see right here. Yep. All right. So that concludes today's podcast. We'll see you back. I'm going to finish drinking my solution. Oh, yeah. Well, I should probably drink mine, too. Uh, All right.